What are some other ways we can have conversations with challenging people? That's what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book Tactics by Gregory Kokel, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. Now, like I said, this is talking about some of the most difficult people we have in our lives, those who are really challenging us to say the hard things, to answer the hard questions. And he, again, is saying, you don't have to knock it out of the park. You don't have to hit a home run. You don't have to make a person bow down before Jesus right in front of you. The idea is you're going to put a stone in their shoe that just nags at them. You know, makes them question, makes them think a little bit. That's the goal. We're supposed to just encourage people to kind of come out of their shell of thinking just a bit. And he talked about his Columbo method. If you don't remember, Columbo was a TV show, I think back in the 70s and early 80s. And he asked these questions that were unassuming, but it was to trap this person into a belief, into a, 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 a way of thinking. And he always knew how to do it in a way that people underestimated him. That And a question that was so good that it really convinced people to think about something in a different way. Well, in the case of the TV show, to give themselves up as the perpetrator of a crime. But in this case, he is just asking you to ask questions that someone maybe never thought of. Like, well, I don't believe that the world was created by God. I think it all happened randomly by nature. Well, what, where's your evidence that it happened randomly by nature? I, I saw a quote the other day from Dawkins that said something to the point of that even if we have no evidence for evolution or Darwinism at all, we should believe it because it's the natural method. So he's saying that in his scientific view, you don't need science to prove Darwinism because it's naturalistic. Meaning he doesn't need evidence for it. He just needs to know it's the natural way. Well, who says the natural way is the way that this earth came about? I believe God created systems and methods of creating this world and making it sustain itself through these systems. But who said it just happened by itself? Were you there? I wasn't there. You know, what, what's your evidence? That people will lack in their own beliefs evidence that they accuse you of not having. Well, you don't have evidence of God. Well, you, you don't have evidence that this was all natural either. But by asking those good questions, he thinks that we can get that pebble in the shoe moment, catch people off guard. Because again, like me, I was a mile wide and an inch deep. I knew a lot of things that I believed, but I didn't know the deep dive on them. I didn't know the answer to this question. I read a book once that said this, and my father told me that. So in my mind, I would not have had many deep methods to confront this or to go back about it. And he said that in this case, when we're talking about questions, he said that we'll be able to see in the answers of others what is plausible, what is likely, or what is possible. And that's really where we start giving that this debating point. Is he give, and when you're thinking to yourself, is this person giving me evidence? Or are they giving me an opinion? And in most cases, people are giving an opinion. Well, I don't think the world was created by God. It was created by natural means. Well, why do you think that? Well, because the natural means doesn't need a God. Well, who says that? I mean, there's a lot of places of error, you know, th that the world just came about in this way. Like I said, there's this hydrogen to matter ratio that if it was off by one degree in one direction, we wouldn't have enough matter to make planets. And if it was off in the other way, we'd have so much matter, it would be constant plunking around of things that, that we have it in this very perfect ratio. Who says, just your opinion, that it didn't need God to make this happen? That's not evidence. That's not reason. That is your opinion. I became a Christian my junior year. I started noticing that professors we're taking pot shots at Christianity. I had one professor tell in the class, well, they're all cannibals because they're eating the body and blood of Christ. They're no better than, you know, cannibals who eat the missionaries who came out and witnessed to them. And I'm like, what? wait, what? 
And some professors would say, well, I'll explain it to, I'll explain it a different way for you Christians out there who can't get this. You know, I mean, it was really rude and not very nice. But he says that in a lot of cases, what will happen is a professor, because they don't listen to what their people are saying, they'll say, well, a lot of Christians say, you know, this, this, and this. Well, you don't know what I think about this. You have no idea. You didn't even ask me what I think about this. But that we shouldn't get baited in to these fights with these professors in the, in, in the way that they're trying to bait it out. Well, don't you think it's possible that the world was just created by a, a series of mistakes? Well, possible, sure, of course. You know, and you could even say, he says that, well, I've made mistakes in my life. You know, of course that's true. But it doesn't weaken any case to say, is it possible? Of course it's possible. You can decide not to be threatened by these challenges or even ask, how, how did you come to whatever conclusion it is that this professor or this person that you're debating came to? How did you come to this decision that the world needs no God to be created? How, how did you get there? Now, I can tell you that I never had an answer for that either. Again, and then at that point, that person will say, in my opinion, we don't need a God. How did you get to that opinion? How did you decide that was the truthful thing? And in the end, you have to realize opinions, yours or theirs, is not true. Or even in some cases where you'll say, there is no God, there's a universal morality. Is there? Because there are lots of civilizations throughout time that found very despicable things to be moral. Child sacrifice. That was a big part of the world of the Bible. When they talked about other worshipers of Baal, worshipers of Baal were sacrificing children. But according to their morality, that was fine. The, the example I always heard is we go to another planet, like this sounds like a Star Trek episode, and there's Nazis on this planet, planet Nazi. So they would think that their morality is just fine. If morality is decided based on the society around it, then you don't need God to have objective morality. We just sort of decide as a civilization what that is. So you can see how we're following this logical thought onwards. He talked to a student and one of his professors said, well, when I get through with you, you won't be a Christian. Boy, that's a big statement right there, huh? And what kind of professor decides that their job is to strip someone of their faith in God? I mean, and I, and I know it's true. I have seen many Christian children walk out of college, practical atheists. If they're not atheists, they sure acted like ones because their college stripped them of their faith or stripped them of what they learned about God. And they decided not to continue onwards with it. What is that? So he said that there's a way to use our tactics. And he said that you might ask the professor, could I have a few more details about what you're talking about? You called my faith a fable. Could you talk more about what kind of fable you think it is? Or you think all religions are exactly the same, that Christianity came out of some sort of Egyptian ISIS. I've seen that before too. Type of faith. Could you tell me more about what that means? And then let the professor or this person fighting you explain themselves. And if he falters, other students will notice that if he has sort of this logic gap that, well, Jesus is really just Isis and Orisis and, you know, it's from this Egyptian faith. And, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Nowhere in the Egyptian faith did you have someone who died for the sins of the people, paid their sins in full. That's, that doesn't sound like the same faith at all. So you, you'll let that person talk and ask more questions. And so instead of them trying to put you on the hot seat, instead, you're just listening. OK, I'm, you know, let's let's take a little time. Go ahead and explain yourself. What exactly does that mean? And in the end, they said it's the professor, because he's the expert's role to defend it. And he said that what's happening is, is not just professor, but, you know, whoever's challenging you, he's trying to get you to do their job of you stumbling so badly that you make a mess of what it is you believe. And instead, you're just turning the table and say, what exactly are you believing when you find that you're facing, he says, any sort of form of prove me wrong challenge, just shift the burden back on them. You know, or if all you Christians, you believe X, Y, and Z, did I, did I ever say that? Did, have I ever said any of that? 
you know, you don't really know me and you don't really know what I believe. But since you know what you think I believe, go ahead, tell me what I believe. I, I've never offered it to you. I've never said a word for it. But go ahead and tell me what it is I believe. He says, in the end, this could be a professor, but it says, don't be afraid to question, to challenge the terms, to point out opinion versus not opinion. And you're challenging them on your own ground. You're not just letting this person run and ransack you or do something. You're letting that per person talk and make their claims. And you don't have to prove their game. They have the burden of proof. They're the ones who made the claims, not you. You didn't say a word probably, right? Or if you said something, you may have said something innocuous like, no, Christianity is not the same religion as Egypt. But why don't you tell me a little bit more about why you think it is? He's the one that said it, you know, this professor. So don't be bullied into getting back into the hot seat again. He can explain, this professor can explain their own opinions. And he said that you can even turn this into a Colombo. Remember, Colombo was unassuming. Boy, it sounds like you know a lot more about the Egyptian religion than I do. You know, why don't you tell me more about that? Why don't you tell me how these two religions are exactly the same? But I always thought that it was Christianity that talked about the forgiveness of sins, while the Egyptians didn't believe in sin and didn't believe in the forgiveness of sins. I understood the pharaohs were meant to be gods themselves. They didn't need forgiveness. So you could keep going, you know, and asking those good, unassuming questions. And he said that there's even words that if you're kind of stuck and you're not knowing what to say, say, you know what, let me think about it, he says. We can talk more about it later. You don't have to feel that if you're being put on a hot seat that you have to start speaking beyond what you know or making something up just so that you can answer a question. Get back to that person, but you have the ability to say, I want to do some homework. I want to look things up. I want to figure some things out, talk to some other people. There's no reason that you have to feel that you have to answer everything on the spot in that moment, exactly as they said, but you know, take good notes and then go ahead and, and research it. This kind of approach is that you're not trying to get out of the question. You're going to come back and talk about it. But you want to be thoughtful about it. You want to think about this. You want to come back with a thoughtful answer. And he says that in the end, you know, you can even say, look, I get it. You want to beat me up in front of everybody. But I'm just trying to be thorough about this. I'm trying to get my facts together about this. That's all. And no one's going to think less of you if you need to. Find some information out. He says, too, that you can also even challenge people if they try taking it off of that topic. You know, I noticed that we were talking about the Egyptian religion being the same as Jesus and Mary. But since then, you have gone off into a couple of different topics that had nothing to do with this. I was really interested in talking about that topic you brought up before we moved on to an old one. Can we, can we continue on with that one conversation? or? I noticed that you're kind of throwing everything in the kitchen sink. Can we just kind of focus on that main topic right now? I, I noticed that as soon as I asked you for more information, you just called me a name. You called me ignorant. You said that I didn't know what I was talking about. That's why I'm asking you a question. I want to hear from your opinion what it is you're trying to say. So let's, instead of name calling, let's just talk about that topic. So you can see how you don't have to get flustered and you don't have to get defensive and you don't have to play the game he says, refuse to take on the burden of proof. They brought up this point. They accused of you of believing something that maybe you believe or maybe you don't believe, but the burden of proof is on them. He says, don't let yourself get bullied into being in what he calls that hot seat. And it is totally fine, again, to say, can I think about it? Let me, let me get some research done. Let me look at this evidence. Let me be thoughtful about this. No one's going to fault you for that. And so then he says the next step in this Colombo defense is to be more uh, on the offense without being offensive. And so that means we use these questions to keep our level of risk low. We've asked good questions of people. And so instead, we're going to ask leading questions of that person to make a point. We're going to use questions now in a more pointed way. Before, we were very open-ended. Well, what do you mean that the world didn't need a creator? How, how do you know that? 
what evidence do you have that the world had no creator? I'm just kind of curious because you said it so matter of factly. But what you gave me afterwards was sort of an opinion about it. Now he says what we're going to do is in this situation, every time he says you ask a question and get a favorable response, the question accomplishes, he says, two things. One is that the person is telling you that he understands your point when you ask this particular question. So that's, again, the next step. We're going to ask a question that proves a point. And each step of the way, he says, you're staying in the driver's seat because now you're using those innocent questions and instead is driving it to a certain direction. And he gives some examples, too, of, well, we don't need Jesus to be forgiven of our sins. We don't really need a God to forgive us of our sins. And then so then you're like, so if we're just well-meaning, if we're very sincere with believing whatever it is we believe, we can take away whatever guilt, whatever things that we've done against each other. Whenever we've been cruel to our mother or cruel to each other, that can be taken away because of our sincerity at other times. And then who are we being sincere to? And who is taking away that sin? If there is no Jesus and there is no God, what entity in the universe is it that is taking on those sins or forgiving us for those sins because we're very sincere? And is that good enough? If I do something horrible to you, I push you off this train we're talking on, and then I'm like, oh, boy, that was really terrible. I shouldn't have done it. Is that the end of it? Is that the end of the, the terrible thing I did to you by pushing you off this train? Well, no, because my sincerity afterwards doesn't accomplish that forgiveness because I just feel good about myself. I think the universe feels good about me, you know, that kind of thing. Or I remember once someone said that they were grateful. And I said, but grateful to who or to what? Well, to the universe. I'm grateful to the universe. And I thought, well, what in the universe? Like what entity? We're talking about science. We're talking about the universe being created naturalistically. What entity in the universe can you be grateful to that would appreciate that kind of gratitude? It's just all molecules and metals and atoms. You know, there's nothing in the universe to be grateful too. Well, I, I mean, I think that there is a spirit in the universe. Oh, so now there's a spirit in the universe. Well, I'm just not as intolerant as you are. You believe that Jesus is the only way. I think that there's a spirit in the universe that doesn't like all this religion. It just likes people who are grateful and sincere. And I said, so I'm intolerant because I think Jesus forgives our sins unconditionally, as long as we ask him to. But you're not intolerant when you say that the universe hates my religion because all the universe cares about is sincerity. Why aren't you intolerant? Why am I just the intolerant one here? And so now it's a little bit more pointed, but you can see that in this another way, I'm putting that person in that same boat. You're just as intolerant as I am. You just have different beliefs than I do. Or even saying something like, I'm a little bit confused at your response. Well, no, I mean, I don't think the universe hates you because you believe in re one religion over another. I just think the universe thinks you're wrong. But what in the universe thinks I'm wrong? What series of molecules put together? Well, I just don't think you can believe in one religion over another. But you do believe in one religion. <laughs> you believe in sending good thoughts out into the universe, right? So you, you see that by the time you ask a question and you sort of tease it apart, I, I think in the end that, that that's where it comes in, is that we, just as human beings, we think we're right. People always think they're right. My dad thought he was right, that all religious people were stupid and intolerant, but he wasn't stupid and intolerant with his intolerance. He was right because he can't be intolerant because he's correct, you know, but Christians think they're correct. Why couldn't a Christian say that same kind of message to him? I think I'm correct. I'm not intolerant. But in the end, we see a lot of people who are in the same boat. They just believe different things. They're just not willing to confess that their belief in something is based on just their beliefs, that they don't have evidence of it, that there's no evidence of what they believe in a way that they're asking you to produce evidence. 
And so instead, you're, you can turn things around so that at least people will see themselves in kind of this debating point and then maybe be more open to a more, more honest conversation. You're right. I believe this is true, just like you believe this is true. But let's, let's just talk now about the differences in our belief. Because in my belief, you are forgiven if you ask for it. That's all you have to do. You don't have to make amends. You don't have to do anything. You have been forgiven. All you have to do is ask. God has paid the debt of anyone who asked for it. And the only reason you don't have that debt paid is because you, you refuse to ask. That's all. People have misconceptions about the Christian faith. They have misconceptions about God. They have misconceptions about you. The question is, is can we now produce this dialogue that at least gets you out of the hot seat for being a horrible person and just says, look, we're all trying to figure this out. This is what I believe, that y you can have eternal life right there at your hands. You have to just stop fighting it. You just have to ask, and it is yours. He kind of gives a lot of examples of conversation. And I think that that's where this book has its strength about, he was talking to a lawyer once and he says, well, do you think people who commit a moral crime should be punished? And then the lawyer was like, well, yeah, that's my whole thing. I'm a prosecuting attorney. Of course I do. Great. So do I. We're, we're agreeing. We both agree that crimes of any moral caliber should be punished. But he, and then go on to say, but that puts us in a tight spot because we've committed moral crimes. Maybe not in the severity of this person who you put on trial last week, but we have. What do we do about that at this point? So then his last points about Colombo is that at times you will agree on things. You will absolutely agree on things. And it, it, it is off-putting, I think, when you agree with someone. You know what? I agree with you. I agree with you that people who hurt other people should pay for their crimes. Absolutely. But what do we do about it when we've done that? And sometimes those questions are putting the burden of proof back on that other person. Sometimes the question is asking a good question and asking that person to explain themselves more. Sometimes the question you ask is bringing out a point and making a point for you. And sometimes your question is agreeing. But in these steps, he said of Colombo, you're going to want to find the evidence, the reason that holds up, he says, the roof of that other person's belief and be able to like observe and understand where that person's coming from. And then seeing where the flaw is, that this roof can't be held up because there's a huge flaw in this thinking, even by this person's own logic. He calls this last stage, finding the flaws. Again, my father believed that Christianity was made up, was a propaganda piece, that the apostles were all trying to pump themselves up to make themselves look great, that the Bible in general was trying to make the Jewish nation, nation look great. And you could say, well, you realize the apostles looked like fools most of the time, and they wrote that down themselves, that the nation of Israel fell short of God's desires, and they wrote that down themselves. If this is a propaganda piece, it is like by far the worst propaganda piece ever. If the apostles wanted to write a propaganda piece, the stories would look more like this, but instead, this is what they said. My dad's whole roof would have fallen in because his idea that the Bible was a propaganda piece for a bunch of fishermen in the middle of the zeros doesn't stand up. It doesn't hold water. Now, I didn't know that at the time when he was telling me these things. I was like, oh, okay. And then you read the Bible yourself and you're like, yeah, this isn't quite the propaganda piece my dad said it was. His roof did not hold up. And he says that in the end, when we come up with a tactical statement, we could say, why don't I try it like this? And you can tell me if you think this is a better way to look at it. Or I'm going to put this out there and you let me know what you think about it. Or say, he says, quote, I'm not sure I agree with the way you put it. Think about this instead. And so there's a way of taking that you listen to this person. You understood what they were saying. You're not just dismissing them and thinking about your next argument when you're 
thinking of the next thing to say, but instead you're listening. You follow the logic of what they're listening to. But this is where I think that logic falls apart. Let's let's talk about that. And some other phrases he gives us is this ability to stop someone who's trying to steamroll you. Is it okay if I take a moment to answer your question before we go on to the next one? Or, you know, this isn't a simple issue right now. Let me just take a moment to myself for a moment and let me uh, consider what you just said. Or let's go back to your first challenge. You said a lot of things there. Let's talk about issue number one. And then we can go to the, is- the next issue on the next thing. Or that's a great question. And I want to give it a really good answer. Is it okay if I take some time and then you write it down and you come back to that person? You, again, don't feel like you have to be a scholar, an expert on everything, that you have to be able to answer people on this point exactly. But the point is that you're not really looking to be an expert about how Noah got the dinosaurs on the ark. You're not looking to be an expert on the history of primordial soup. What you're doing is you're asking the question, you're turning the, be- the burden of proof on them and making explain themselves. And then you're listening and you're looking for places, again, where that wall can't hold up the roof of what this person believes. And if there are times when you feel like you can take back something, you can do a little bit of research and get back to them, that's fine too. It's important more so to listen and to understand their argument and understand what they're saying than it is to become this instant expert on primordial soup or whether the Council of Nicaea invented the Christian faith. That's not the point here. The point here is you're listening to what that person says. Even like where people talk about that, oh, the Bible is just filled with a bunch of mischaracterizations. There are 40 lines in the Bible that are considered to be out of sync with each other. And they're footnoted and explained. The mark of the beast is 666 or 616. It'll tell you right there. Or it'll say most of the original pieces of text of Matthew don't include this chapter. So there are very few places where there's actual mistakes or parts about it. And so you don't have to know that off the top of your head, but that's something you can find out later. And he gives another warning to all of us to stay away from jargon. Certainly, that was something that was big with me is that I didn't know a lot of Christian jargon. And so when people would talk about, oh, I think even the word sin, my my grandmother would say, well, we don't have sin in Judaism. I said, well, do people do things that are wrong towards each other or wrong towards God? Oh, sure. And I'm like, I think that's what people mean by sin. I wasn't a Christian at this point, but I'm like, I think the word sin just means you did something wrong to another person or towards God. But that word put her hackles up. You know, she didn't want to talk about sin. She didn't want to talk about Christian jargon in general or to even say the word the Bible because to her, the Bible was the Old Testament. It wasn't the New Testament. So why not use, you know, specifics? Well, in the book of John, this is what he said was the fulfillment, or the book of Matthew talks specifically about that, or the Hebrew prophecies talked about this. You can talk without using Christian jargon. I think he's right. Sometimes Christian jargon can just make people's eyes roll up in the back of their head. So instead, he talks about us, you know, making sure that we're speaking our honest truth, that we give reasons, we stay calm, we don't use these big languages, but that, again, we're not letting them leave empty-handed. If there's something that you can follow up with them, if there's like a, you find a booklet that talks exactly about what they were talking about, but explains it maybe in a more eloquent way than you were, go get them that that, that uh, booklet. Give them something that they can walk away with, that they can read at their own pace. But these are all things. And he says in the end, our job is to be an ambassador, which means that we're ready to be an ambassador. We're patient. He says we're tactical, but that we're clear and honest and fair and humble. One thing about, and I'll tell you this is true, is that when you hear someone preaching the word of God to you, if you get a whiff of I'm better than you are because I believe in God and you don't, boy, that that just ends the conversations right there. And no, in the end, he says that we are ambassadors, but we're relying on God's power. We're relying on the Holy Spirit. This is not our message. This is said so many times in the Bible that God will give us the words to say, that he will help us in being good witnesses in all of this. 
Um, so I hope this helps. Like I said, this book I thought was a good book. He has another one after this also. But trying to talk about how we can be a little bit more pointed in how we talk to people when they're asking us the very hardest questions we have to face. There are people who are good at it, and there are some people who think they're good at it. I was in that second category. I thought I was good at it, but boy, I didn't know. This book, I think, helps a lot. So my challenge to you is think about ways that you could be that ready, patient, armed with the Holy Spirit, witness for God, that we're going to be humble. Are there situations where you can maybe reach out a little bit more to people who are pointedly against you and start having these Columbo conversations where you ask good questions, you challenge the walls that are holding up this roof in a nice and honest and, and inquisitive way. But again, making sure that we listen to what the person is actually saying. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. This book is a bit of a challenge. Like I said, it is so dense and so thick and so full of really great ideas that I think if you're looking for more ways to talk to people about God, he has a bunch of videos on YouTube. He has these two books that he has written, and they're all in that line of how you can more pointedly talk to other people about God. So think about what you could do in order to reach people that way. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you and know how you're doing in your Christian walk or if there are topics that you would like to talk about. And remember, our walk with other people always starts with small steps and smaller questions. 